Please turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 28. I'm going to begin reading with verse number 10. The Bible says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted up a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And will bring thee again unto this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone which he had put for his pillows, and set it for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again into my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Heavenly Father, Lord God in heaven, we come before you this morning. and We are so thankful, dear Lord, for your precious provision and your promise, and your presence, dear Lord, in our life. And Father God, that you are so real in our life. And Father God, we thank you so much for the blessings of salvation. And Father, Father God, for the provision of being able to live this life in your care, in your provision, and to be able to be a, a representative, a proper representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, thank you for each and every person here today, dear Lord. You know each and what, every one of our hearts. And Father, if there's one here this morning that's not saved, Father God, may they not leave here without the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father God, bless those that are listening and watching. Speak to their hearts. Father, minister to us all. And Lord, may we be useful for your honor and for your glory. And we'll give you the praise for it. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. As Christians, we talk a lot about God. We talk a lot about Jesus. We talk about the Holy Spirit, we talk about religion, we talk about the church, and have a lot of conversations about the things of God. But outside of those conversations in our everyday life, how much of our day do we have an awareness that the Holy Spirit of God is not only with us, but within us? God is with us. And we are to be close to God. And we're to have a realization that He's working in our life. That He's doing everything, working everything out for our good. Oh, there's challenges. And we have challenges. And I can praise God for the people that when they have those challenges, they get close to God. You can see it in their face. You can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their conversation. You can see it in their confidence. Praise God. God is real in our life. And if God is real in our life, then we're going to have a proper reverence for God. We're going to give God proper respect. And we're going to acknowledge God for who He is. We need to see God like Isaiah saw God. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 it says in the year that King Uzziah died I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high 
and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Let me tell you what, our eyes may have never seen the Lord, the King of hosts, but we know him. He's real to us. And we need to have that holy respect. That fear of God. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 34, verse 9, he says, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Now, that's a wonderful promise. There's no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Shall not want any good thing. What do you have to do? You have to seek the Lord. Proverbs 3, verse 7 says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and the presses shall burst out with new wine. Honor the Lord, it says. That's the problem in the United States of America today. We have lost proper respect and honor for our God. And a lot of us have sat by silent. As a nation, we no longer reverence God. We no longer, we no longer reverence His Son or, or His Word. And thus, we have the wicked and the evil environment in which we live in today. Within the shores of the United States of America. That's the reason why we have a failing economy. That's the reason why we have an immoral condition among the people that is very prevalent instead of righteous and, and, and good living. When there is disrespect for God and the Word of God, and, and as open and as blatant as it is in our country, then the blessings and the provision of God are removed. And that's what happened to us these last few decades. And you know what? You remove God and the things of God, and something's going to take its place. And that something is Satan and the things of Satan. And that's what's happened in our nation today. And we're in great trouble. I don't care what anybody says. It's a serious situation. Because we do not have a proper reverence for God. And if God's going to be real in your life, you're going to serve God. When you get saved, you're going to serve God because God has got a will for you as a born-again child of God. Something for you to fulfill and to do. There in, in, in Genesis chapter 28, verse 20, it says, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will... Give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I came again to so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Let me tell you what, you got to be willing to serve God unconditionally. I don't Jacob, he was putting some requirements on God. If, if God will be with me and keep my way. If you'll give me bread to eat, if you put raiment on me, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Let me tell you what, there are no ifs in our willingness to serve God. That's a gimme. There's no debate, there's no nothing. You just, you serve God. Period. We put no requirements on God. God says what we're supposed to be doing is loving him with our full being. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, 
with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Real love is a commitment and a loyalty. Even in our relationships here on this earth. Loyalty, commitment to one another. A loving relationship has two ingredients. Commitment and loyalty. The first commitment, the, the first commandment deals with these things. Exodus 20, verse 3, God says, Thou shalt have no other God before me. What he's saying is you are to be committed to me and you're to be loyal to me. And there's no other gods before me. So God commands our total commitment and loyalty. And as we just read, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our being. Not the attitude of, well, I guess it's what I'm supposed to do, you know. And if I don't, and I don't show up to church on Sunday, the preacher will probably call me. I don't know where I am. And then there's people with the attitude of, what did I get out of it? They're always wanting, wanting something instead of just being committed and loyal, trusting God. You do that and God will bless you. You won't have to worry about your wants and your needs. I mean, just think about all that God's done for us. I mean, if God did nothing but save us, how blessed we are. But he goes so far beyond that. He meets our needs spiritually, physically, mentally, financially, you name it. Seek ye first of the kingdom of God and all these things are going to be added to you. God does not lie. You ever think about this? God created the angels. God created man. Both fell. But for the fallen angels, there was no plan to, of reconciliation. But for you and I, praise God, there was. And I don't understand it, but I tell you what, it's the grace of God. And thank God for it. That he loved us enough to make a plan of reconciliation, a plan of salvation. He loved us that much. Wow. We ought to be thankful God just loved us enough to give us the plan of, of salvation. Next thing, if God's real in our life, we're going to live for Him. It's going to be evident. In fact, I believe after we get saved, I know after we get saved, there is a desire in your heart to live for the Lord. You want to know more about the Lord. You want to know more about the Word of God. You want to share your Jesus with somebody. You want to know how to live godly and live purely and live right. God knows we're not perfect. Don't worry about that. He, <laughs> he covered that at Calvary. And He works with us. He wants us to live for Him. And God knows we're never going to be perfect on this earth. But with the help of God and a little loyalty, a little dedication, we can live for Him. We can serve Him. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 says, The first man is, on, is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as is the earthy. Such are they also that are earthy, as is the heavenly. Such are they that also are heavenly. And as we have... Born the image of the earthy, we also bear the image of the heavenly. Now the first man is, is Adam. Second man, the Lord Jesus Christ. We got both. Paul, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7 and verse 8, whichever one you give the most commitment to, and dedication and loyalty to, and you feed the Spirit, then you're going to walk in the Spirit. You're not going to walk in the old man. And so God gives us that ability. Man, because we've been saved, because we've experienced that second birth, because we have a spiritual life now, we're to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 49 says, And as we have begotten, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we also bear the image of the one 
heavenly. That means every hour, every minute, every second of the day, we're to be living for the Lord. Our, la our life is to be counting and counting for all eternity. Matthew 8, 19, Jesus tells us, don't lay up stuff. Don't lay up yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, ever your heart be also. That is so true today. What, whatever we are, are, are making our treasure, our interest, then that's what's going to dominate in our life and our living. Either the things here on this earth are the things of God and the things of heaven. And if God is real to us and we're saved, then God should be having an impact upon the way we live, influencing our life every single day. And when we do that, then we'll be in true service for the Lord. And, we're re and we are laying up rewards in heaven. How? Because of our obedience, by having faith and growing in our faith. By faith, we allow God to be real to us. Like I said before, some people tend to let the world influence them. And that's what's real to them. But we're to have faith. Faith is defined in the Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the things not seen. In other words, every promise of God is real. It's reality. We can believe it. We can trust it 100%. We see this world. We walk around this world every day. We see the things of this world. We've not seen God. We've never seen Jesus. But we got the Word. We got the Word. You want better faith? Get into the Word. Romans 10, 17, For faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Not by reading the newspaper. Not by watching the news. No. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. Can you imagine if, 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 if most Americans today would spend as much time in the Bible as they do reading the newspaper and watching the boob doob? Man, we'd have a holy nation. We'd have people just bubbling over with Jesus. Satan does not want you to grow in faith. That's why he hinders. That's why God says our faith stops him. Ephesians 6.16. God says above all. In other words, above everything else. We want to defeat the devil. And he says do that by taking the shield of faith. Wherewith you shall, shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Every single attack of Satan can be stopped in his tracks. If we just have faith. If God is real to us, we will give ourselves to him. Everything we have, including our life, is from him. We got a lot of people walking around on this earth today that, that doesn't even consider what God has, that, that God gave them the very life that they have and the breath to breathe. They don't even they don't even consider that. But we have our 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 life and our breath and our being because of Him. A wonderful teaching there in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And let me tell you what, that verse goes far beyond finances. Now giving is, is, is what we're supposed to do. Tithing and giving of our love gifts. Being obedient to the Lord when he says to give. And how to give, that's very important. Don't take me wrong. And he'll bless you for that. Read that again. 
But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he... So we purpose this in our heart, whether we're going to sow a little or we're going to sow a lot. So let him give, and don't give grudgingly or just because you're, you think you're obligated to give. No, it says God, live, God honors a cheerful giver. Because they want to, they desire to, they want to please God. They're not selfish, they're not greedy. But that goes, like I said, that goes far beyond our finances. This goes to our time. The precious commodity of time that God gives to each and every one of us. And we do not know how long that's going to be. This time tomorrow, we may not be here. It was a rapture. Praise God. But we don't know. We don't know what a day holds. God tells us our life is that little vapor going above that boiling pot there. You see the, you see the vapor above the pot, and, and just above that, it just kind of disappears. He says that's how your life is. And, and see, all of us seem to want to think that we're going to live to be 90 or 100 years old. <laughs> oh, God bless my body if I do. <laughs> but that may not happen. And it doesn't happen all the time. We know that. But our time, time to pray. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5, 16. Let me tell you what, the time we invest in praying gives us a very high and valuable dividend. Not only praying, but reading studying, thinking about the Word of God. And why, why does God say for us to study the Word? Study to show thyself approved unto God. And there's a purpose for that. There's, there's a reason for that. That you won't be ashamed. And not only that, you're going to become a workman. And you're not going to be ashamed. Why? Because you're going to, be, you're going to understand and apply the truth of God. As God wants us to. And let me tell you, as you probably already know, Bible study and reading and thinking about the Word of God is one of the things that Satan fights the most. I mean, you've got to be determined. Because Satan's going to put a roadblock in the way. He doesn't want that faith to get any bigger. He doesn't want that faith to come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Because Satan knows that's a great benefit for us. In overcoming him. God gives us time. We should give time to our church. What's the church? It's people. People. We take that for granted too much. We talk about the church. We're not, we're not talking about the building. And one day this building is going to burn up. Hopefully after we've got done with it. <laughs> But we, we're the church. People. Jesus died for the church, which is you and I. And you and I should be important to you and I. So we have to give our time to, to others, serving others. Ephesians 4.13 says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fitly joined together. That's talking about the local body of believers. And compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. In other words, it's going to take care of itself by God's plan. Maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. 
It takes time to talk with people, to encourage people, to be with people, to call people. It takes time to hand out tracts at the flea market. It takes time to go door to door and outreach 6,000. It takes time to go out and hand out New Testaments. It takes time to hand somebody a track and invite them to church. It takes time to be a Sunday school teacher. Don't ever think your Sunday school teacher just gets up in front of you, opens their Bible or their, 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 their class plan, and that's all they do. No, don't work that way. No, there's hours of prayer and study put into that. Same thing with Tuesday night Bible class. It takes time. It takes time for John and, and Brother John and Miss Rachel to work with our young people. It takes time and preparation. It takes time to be a church. And if we're going to let God be real, and if we're going to let God impact our living, then it's going to take some giving of our time. God will bless that, though. God will bless that abundantly. And we need to be serving God with our talents, with our abilities, with our gifts. I mean, everything that God has entrusted to us. God has given us those things to honor him, to reach out to others. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 says, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Let him be Lord. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you knowledge and he'll give you understanding. Not only in the word of God, but with people. I am not a patient person. God's been working on me now for many years. And I guess I'm just rebellious. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Ginger knows. <laughs> But it takes patience. You know, I've often said if there wasn't such a spirit of love in this church that we have, we'd be throwing eggs and tomatoes at each other every time we came here. <laughs> but what does God's word say? Charity, which is love in action, never fails. You see? So we can all come together, and we've got different outlooks, different things going on and different problems and if we'll let God God will God'll, God'll make a unity and God blesses that unity we see that all through the book of Acts but God is the one that gives us our strength our breath I tell you I, I got up out of bed this morning and I thought to myself well, I actually wouldn't get out of bed I got up out of the recliner <laughs> but I thought Thank you, Lord. And I, I can remember a morning I couldn't walk. You know? But he just, he's just so gracious to us. So good. You know, God, God gives us the ability to be a contributor and not a leech. Think about that. We, we got enough leeches. <laughs> Man, we want to be in that contributor line. Ecclesiastes 3.13 says, And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. It is the gift of God. Amen. Think about it. God gives us the attitude to be ambitious. I don't know why, but some people missed that, didn't they? I, and some people, I just don't see any ambition. I mean, to tell you, since I was a kid, somebody's been telling me to be ambitious. Thank God. And if you're saved, God's telling you to be ambitious. Don't be lazy. Man, our government's going to make you be lazy. Well, I better stop right there. But God makes us capable of being productive. 
Deuteronomy 8, 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Not just money. Too many people focused on the wealth of this world. Well, boy, thank God for the wealth of God. Man. God gives us peace of mind. He gives us contentment. He gives us the ability to love and to be loved. All good things are from God. That's what it says in James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variables, neither shadow of turning. When we give ourselves over to God, We'll make time for others. Too many, too many Christians play hide and seek with their church family. God gives us a wonderful church. We're, we're so blessed and we're so, we just don't even realize it. And, and, and every year God sends in, I'm going to call you folks our winter people, okay? But there are people, they're with us, they're our church. They're part of us. It's not a three-month or a four-month or a six-month thing. It's an all-the-time thing. You know? Our winter, winter, winter people call and say, pray for this, pray for that. How's everybody doing? What's this? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. They're concerned. They care. And we care about them. It's a wonderful thing when God puts a church together. First Corinthians 13, 2 says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, that's love in action, I am nothing. That's what the Bible says. And have not charity, I am nothing. Charity is love in action. Charity is love doing something. Being more than just verbal about it. If God is real in our life, God's people will be real in our life. Just read through Acts 1, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3. And you'll see what a real church family is about. And it's so sad today that so very few believers, so very few church members really know what church is about. But when we allow God and the love of God to dominate in our thinking and in our actions, then church becomes real. It becomes real. And if God... It's the God of our life. And God's real in our life. And God's real in our church. And you know what we're going to be doing? We're going to be sowing the gospel. We're going to be getting out the word. Anywhere and everywhere. Amen. Well, thank God for our missionaries. They go where we can't go. They go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And the greatest thing of all, God wants to help us. He wants to help us. The Bible tells us in James 4, 7, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Draw near to God. But he also says, resist the devil. Resist him. Don't help him. Don't give him place. Get up every morning before your feet hits that floor and say, God, help me to resist the devil today. Amen. And he will. But God's got to be real in our life. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. And when you resist the devil, what does it say? He will flee from you. That's what God said. Then he says, draw nigh to God. Draw near to God. And he'll draw near to you. 
Man, we want to be near God. We want to be very close to God. So how real is God to us? God is only real to us as we are near to him, as we are close to him. When we get close to God, he's very real. How close are we to God? We can answer that question by this. How many times in the course of a day are your thoughts about God, the things of God, God's people? That'll tell you how close you are to God. Does our thoughts throughout the day focus on God, focus focus on others, focus on the needs of others? Spiritually and otherwise? How much, how often do we pray? How often do we look into the Word of God besides Sunday morning at 11 o'clock? Is God real? How real is God to us? And I pray that God is so real to you this morning that you've already made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Because that's what God's all about. God says that he loved you so much that he gave us Jesus. He gave Jesus to die on a cross, to shed his blood, to give his life and be, rose, right, be risen again. I get that right. For you and me. And boy, if you're not here, if you're listening this morning or you're here this morning... And you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? God is not real to you. And, and, and let, me pop, let me pop your little bubble. You are not God's child if you're not saved. Everybody says, oh, we're all God's children. No, we are all God's creation. We do not become a child of God, get into the family of God, until we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Then you become a child of God. So you need to be a child of God. Because if you're a child of God, God's going to take care of you. He's the perfect parent. So if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, you need to know him. Don't leave here without him. God is so good. Is God real enough to you and I that we live really do live for Him? Do we? What does dominate our day? I know we got responsibilities. God gives us responsibilities. Some people to work, some people to bring up a family, some people to do both. But what, you know, even even in times when you're busy (laughs) and you're doing things, man, God ought to be crossing your thoughts somewhere. Because God's real. God needs to be real in our life. And when God's real in our life, let me tell you what, no matter what's going on in this old stinking world, it doesn't make any difference. And I don't care anymore. Because my God is real to me, and my God's in control. Is God real in our life? Heavenly Father, Lord God in heaven, we come to you this morning, Lord, and I pray that you are very real in our lives. I I pray that every person here today is saved, and I pray that every person that's listening is saved. But Lord, if if they're not, if there's someone here or someone watching today and they're not saved, dear Lord, Oh, Lord, let the Holy Spirit draw them close to you, Father. Let them call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Let them admit that they're a sinner, dear Lord, and acknowledge that Jesus died for their sin and ask Jesus to come into their life and be their Lord and Savior. Oh, Lord, if there's someone here today that's not saved, don't let them leave here without you, Lord. And, Lord, help us as believers, Lord, to make you very real in our life. No matter how close we are to you now, Lord, we can get closer. And Father God, we need to be close to you. 
and we need to be following your plan for our life. So, Father God, help us to have that loyalty. Help us to have that dedication, Lord. Help us to have that love for your honor, for your glory. Work in us and through us, Lord. Speak to our hearts, Lord, that we might be obedient. We praise you. We thank you. We ask that your will be accomplished. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.